Hello everyone and welcome to this Halloween episode of Chapter Select, where today we'll be examining the contents of your nightmares, your little nightmares, the kind seen earlier in the year when a sequel to a creepy little platformer released. If you don't know much about the Little Nightmares series, allow me to explain. They are a couple of platformers sitting somewhere between 2D and 3D, set in a world of horrors, and you are a tiny child. Like, a super tiny child. Just look at how tiny you are. The first game fascinated me because it was coming from Little Big Planet co-developers Tarsier Studios and looked a lot like Tim Burton had gotten his hands on that franchise and then fell into a deep despair in the process. Both games are also notoriously ambiguous in their storytelling. Your character is never named directly in-game and there is no dialogue to speak of. But there is definitely something going on, something we are never given any explanation to. In the first game, you play as Six, a little girl in a raincoat trapped on a big, scary cruise ship full of gross chefs and a load of guests desperate to devour her. In the second, you play as Mono, a small boy with a bag on his head venturing through a creepy city full of horrible teachers and oh god, creepy killer mannequins. Why? Little Nightmares is fascinating in its approach to storytelling, and so in today's episode of Chapter Select, we're going to examine just what on earth is going on in these games and celebrating how its ambiguity works in its favour. As always, there are full spoilers for Little Nightmares 1 and 2 throughout the video, and there is some discussion of tough subjects such as child abuse, suicide, and manipulation. Viewer discretion is advised, and if you are affected by any of these issues, I have provided some resources in the description that I encourage you to use. It would be sensible to start discussing Little Nightmares' story by telling you what happens in it, but that's tricky because it never properly explains itself. You are a child, you move through a hostile world full of threats, and then you escape, maybe? Outside of that, everything else is hinted or intentionally vague. Both games start their stories with the main character waking with a start following a, well, Little Nightmare. In the first game, we see a strange woman in a dark void before Six wakes up in a suitcase inside a ship. In the second, an ominous corridor with an eyeball door at the end leads to Mono waking up in a field. Both children then start walking right and immediately encounter horrors, a hanged body in the first game and cages and traps in the second. What becomes quickly obvious is how these two protagonists compare to their environments. Six and Mono are both tiny, dwarfed by the world that they exist in. Only spaces specifically meant for children are an appropriate size, the playroom early on in the first game and parts of the school in the second game. Everything else is a towering monstrosity compared to our protagonists. This is a key part of the gameplay, with the characters in each game using drawers, stacks of plates and shelves as climbing apparatus. The sheer size of the furniture also provides a lot of hiding places for the two, which is the one benefit to this size discrepancy. This scale is also a key to begin understanding what's happening. Thanks to the lack of dialogue, or indeed any explanation of any kind, we have to infer everything from the places and things we encounter along the way. And without an explanation to why the world is so massive, we have to figure it out ourselves. So here's a sensible explanation, likely staring you all in the face. The world is an exaggeration of these children's fears. Children, in case you are unaware, are small. So to them, a world designed for adults, by adults, looks comparatively massive. And that's what we're seeing in these games, a horrifyingly distorted version of that perspective. So if you're a tiny interloper in this world of giants, who is this world made for? The answer to that question isn't much better than the world we're seeing. In the first game, there are four distinct areas belonging to a different adult or group. There's the bizarre janitorial area run by a blind, long-armed creature, a vast kitchen run by a group of horrible, bloated chefs, a guest area populated by gluttonous monstrosities, and finally, a fine suite that houses a freakishly thin woman with a hatred for her own reflection. In the second game, the field you wake up in is populated by a hideous hunter, the school is full of porcelain-headed children and a teacher with a neck that won't quit, a dilapidated and unwelcoming hospital is populated by a horrible doctor creature, and fuck me, these mannequin bastards, why? And then the rest of the twisted city is populated by a seemingly hypnotised and crazed population with a behatted slender man at the heart of it all. Any one of these would be terrifying to encounter, but you face off against all of them across the two games. And you're almost always completely defenseless too. Now imagine how many adults the average child encounters and how much the message that you shouldn't trust strangers is drilled into them. 
all these huge people that they're being warned are a potential danger, and it's not hard to imagine a child seeing all of them as towering monstrosities looking to devour them. A janitor that sees a child in the vicinity as an annoyance and will grab them as soon as they realise they're hanging around, specifically to get rid of them. And no matter where that child might hide to try and get away from it, the janitor has organised their space so they can easily access what they need at any time. What might seem like an impossible height to a child is a simple reach upwards for the janitor, so the child might see that janitor as having impossibly long arms grasping for them. The guest area full of loud adults could be terrifying for children. When you're the smallest one in the room surrounded by people significantly larger than you, who's to say what those big scary adults are going to do? Oh, they're going to chase and eat you, well I guess that checks out. A strict teacher could be seen as an imposing figure towering over you, and that teacher's abilities to seemingly know what you're up to at any time could make you imagine that teacher can wind their neck around any obstacle to keep an eye on you. And not the first fictional representation of this, as the teacher isn't far off Gerald Scarf's interpretation of Pink Floyd's strict teacher figure in the wall. The same could be said of any adult in the games. While in-game every single adult is a violent threat that will murder you with the slightest provocation, we need to examine all these through a metaphorical lens. We may not be seeing reality. The vagueness of Little Nightmares is very intentional. We don't truly know what's going on and the game revels in that. In the first game we know we're on a ship and in the second we know we're in a city, but beyond that it's a total mystery. We don't know why we're being hunted so relentlessly, what anyone's aims are, or even how this world works. In fact, examining things even more deeply reveals that nothing particularly makes sense. In the first game, there appears to be a whole operation designed to imprison children based on the janitor's area. We then move into an area full of mystery meat being prepared, then an area where gluttonous guests swallow this mystery meat down in large quantities and get very excited when a child runs through. It's a world that devours children, apparently. It's horrifying, but what kind of society can survive by eating its children regularly? Not to mention, at that size, they can't be particularly filling or nutritious, that's just silly. There's not a lot of sense in the second game's progression either, and it's even less obvious to find a through thread. The school and hospital are typical horror environments, but how do they relate to the hunter that comes before? And the final act focuses on TVs and a mysterious signal which seems to move even further away from whatever happens prior to that. This all comes back to the idea of seeing the world through a child's eyes. Not only is everything terrifyingly larger than you, but you also have no explanation for anything in your world. And by placing children into these ambiguous stories as the protagonists, you are enhancing this. Children don't have a clue what's going on. Our entire childhoods are meant to be an introduction to everything in the world around us, taught by parents and teachers how the world works. And until we acquire that knowledge, everything is a grand unknown. And as we established last Halloween, nothing is scarier than nothing. And the absence of knowledge leads to the brain concocting wild theories. Children are much more imaginative than adults and will turn these gaps in knowledge into wild fantasies based on what little they do know. And these children know that strangers are bad, strangers are big, and all the bedtime stories I've read have witches that eat children. So therefore, all strangers are witches that eat children. So Six, trapped in the bowels of a strange ship, surrounded by strangers and darkness, can only assume the strangers are the aforementioned witches and that the darkness hides monsters. Take a look at this shoe dump early on where something hides in the spaces we can't see and charges straight for Six, like a child would imagine. And it's only one of many moments that can be read this way across both games. All this horrible imagery is what a child imagines the world to be, not what it truly is. In reality, the moor could be a straightforward cruise ship, and Six has gotten herself lost in places she shouldn't be, and Mono is a little kid who ran away from home and is now desperately regretting his decision. The world of Little Nightmares might be lovely, maybe it looks more like Tarsier's other little game. You don't know, that's not the story these games are telling. Neither Mono or Six learn to see this possible good in the world, because Little Nightmares has something else to say within its dark and confusing world. The question is, why would a child see the world in such a horrible way? A world that could be perfectly fine, but to these children is a terrifying oversized nightmare land full of threatening giants. The obvious answer here is to say it's representative of child abuse. After all, in many cases we see children in distress. In the first game, Six wakes up in a suitcase which she was seemingly bundled into like a discarded towel. 
The opening areas are full of cages, some of which have child-shaped figures inside them, as someone is imprisoning them for unknown reasons. In the second game, the teacher slams her ruler down on children's desks and shrieks at them. And in the city area, adults will watch TV and then scream and attack when the kids get in the way of their stories. These children fear these adults so much. Adults that scream and attack and give chase if the child so much as appears in a place that they're not supposed to be. And in some tragic homes, this is the lived experience of some children. Unable to express themselves or even show their face to the adults they're supposed to rely on. They hide and sneak around, hoping to not ignite the adult's rage. The children of this world are not treated like the future generation they are, but instead something to be used and discarded. I think this is too simple a reading, however. While certainly this is a cruel world full of cruel people, the extent at which this world hates these children goes way beyond an abusive home or an abusive school system. It is an abusive world, one that hits hard across the board. Because the game shows another fate that awaits children here. In the school, you encounter a lot of other kids, all of them wearing grotesque matching porcelain heads. This isn't a helmet either, as numerous times you do have to smash your way through these kids, revealing the porcelain as their actual heads. Worst of all, they're empty. These kids are also running the halls. They're horrible, cruel, and allowed to run rampant. They see Six and Mono as targets and will leap at them at the slightest provocation. The rules are clear. You join in with the violence and the aggression, or you suffer at their hands. They are bullies, abusers in their own right. And when you see how the teacher treats children, it's clear that it starts from the top. This teacher is about hard discipline, and her classes are silent, unpleasant affairs, where the squeak of chalk on the blackboard is a tense and threatening sound. This teacher appears to want to mould these children into the brats we see elsewhere, not least because their heads are all quite literally created to be identical and devoid of independent thought inside. Once again, the message is to conform or be devoured. Where are the parents in this world? Judging by the apartment buildings we travel through, they're glued to TV to such a degree that they fly into a rage if the programming is taken away from them. We even see an element of this in the first game as one portion of the janitor section requires you to turn on a TV to distract him, as he clings to it, listening to the weird program being shown. And if they're not glued to the TV or flying into a rage, they are painfully despondent. We witness suicide everywhere, including a line of people jumping off a roof all at once. Imagery of this kind isn't unusual to see throughout both games, in fact, the first game shows a hanged man within the first few moments. Once again, conform and watch your mandated television programs to pacify you, or be devoured by despair. And that's assuming the broadcasts aren't encouraging the suicide in the first place, which they likely are. The Signal is a key plot in the sequel story, and it's clear that its presence is driving this whole society. A series of broadcasts and messages designed to instill rage and despondence in its viewers, broadcast 24 hours a day and made to be addictive. It's not exactly a subtle critique of news cycles full of sensationalist stories designed to keep its readers afraid and anxious in order to keep them coming back for advice on what to do. News media that actively lies or distorts the truth to favour the ruling parties and encourages us to hate and fear our neighbours. It's present all around us in the real world, and anyone without an understanding of media literacy is easily swayed by it. This affects everyone, including the young. If adults are living in fear and anger, this gets passed on to the children and the cycle continues. And this cycle can best be seen in Six and Mono themselves. You see, while much of each game is focused on escaping the creepy monsters pursuing you, the methods these children use to escape aren't just about stealth ducking through vents the adults can't pursue them through. It gets much worse than that. Six escapes the janitor in the first game by trapping his arms in a freight lift, slicing them free from his body with the weight of the door. In the second game, Mono shoots the hunter in the woods with his own shotgun, and later the duo work together to roast a doctor alive in a cremation oven, the grimness of this scene punctuated by Six casually sitting by the flames and warming her hands. These children are not innocent. In this world, no one is. In order to survive, these kids have to engage in the same behaviour as the horrific adults they're surrounded by. And worst of all, both games end with these kids becoming those adults, both symbolically and literally. At the end of the first game, Six faces off against the Lady, presumably the owner of the moor and the one inviting all the guests. 
After weakening her with her own reflection, Six then devours her body, turning the tables and absorbs the lady's power. This results in her walking through the guests, sucking their essence out as she passes, killing them all in the process, before casually walking out into the wider world. At the end of the second game, Mono becomes trapped in the signal tower, and after spending much of the later part of the game running from a creepy thin man, the ending sees him becoming the thin man, most likely as part of a cycle of thin men. Because that's the thing, isn't it? These grotesque, massive adults were once the tiny children that we play as in these games. And the true horror is growing up to become the adults who threaten us. And while you can run down a vent to escape one of these adults as a child, once you're one of them, it gets a lot harder to run away. Six absorbs the lady's power and essentially becomes her, while Mono quite literally transforms into the Thin Man. And the worst part of the latter? Six is directly responsible. She gets taken into the signal tower and forced to grow into a grotesque creature until Mono reverses the process. But at the end, she still betrays him and drops him into the inescapable fleshy interior of the tower. She allows him to be devoured by the system. Then because the first game is set after the second, she devours the system and takes its power for herself. Because while these children can be literally devoured as part of the gameplay, in the story they never escape and get devoured in a metaphorical way. They become a part of this messed up society, a product of the environment that they grew up in. A world controlled by news media that hypnotises and enrages, full of teachers who enforce rather than enrich, and ships full of gluttonous creeps gorging themselves while children starve on the sidelines. The true horror of Little Nightmares isn't the grotesque imagery and looming scenery, it's the realisation of how much this mirrors the ills of our own society, one where innocence is crushed and children are forced to conform and become the adults that terrify them so much. Adults that abuse their positions instead of protecting these very small things that need to be nurtured. Little Nightmares is the world seen through a child's eyes, and how all the worst things in the world, the things that the sympathetic adults may struggle to explain to them, become magnified and grotesque. And while none of this is explicit, the game uses its medium to full effect, projecting this message entirely through its environment, and it's incredibly effective at doing so. And the moral of this horrible tale? Find ways to break the cycle, no matter how small they may be. Learn to be kind as a defiant act, and avoid creating little nightmares of your own. Thank you for watching, and happy Halloween.